Listeners be advised, the Holiloquy podcast discuss matters related to the human experience and many that are sexual in nature. Due to this, some conversations may surround triggering topics such as sexual violence, self-harm, abuse, and much more. Please be advised, a list of crisis and psychological resources will be available in the show notes of this episode. With that said, let's get started with the show. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention please as we go through the following safety instructions. In the event that there is a loss of cabin pressure, oxygen mask will drop from the overhead. Place the mask over your nose and mouth. Breathe normally as oxygen is flowing even if the mask is not exposed. Be sure to adjust your own mask before helping others. Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to the Holiloquy Podcast, where we step out and speak on sexuality. This is your favorite host, Vernon T. Scott, also known as Slater Jackson, and for you freaking motherfuckers out there, Sebastian Adams. On today's episode, it's a Planned Parenthood episode, and I am blessed to have Sharita on the line with me, this sex therapist, this phenomenal woman that she is. Sharita, how are you doing today? Good. I'm having a really great time today. Good to hear. Good to hear, y'all. It is season fucking two of the Holiloquy podcast. Who would have thought? I did. (laughs) Ha ha. Whatever. But, Sharita, since we're in a whole new season and, you know, some people need to catch up and whatnot, do you mind reintroducing yourself to everybody, what you do, what you're about, who you are, all the great stuff that is Sharita? Yeah, so um, brief introduction. Um, I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. I've been doing therapy for about seven years at this point. Um, I'm also a certified sex therapist under the Sexual Health Alliance. So not only am I working with couples and families, but I'm working and talking about these own sexual issues that we're talking about right now. Um, And uh, so I also am a manager on the side as well awesomeness we love to see it y'all sharita is goals she is real goals because you know one day i'm going to have that title of sex therapist as well and also marriage and family therapist so i look up to this woman love to see her thrive out here Uh, and also for people who might be interested in you know if you're in georgia and uh, might need some therapy uh, i do i will be including her uh information below so you can look into her um If you feel the need of booking an appointment with her, you can always do so. Um, But just to let you know, if she's full, she's full. And that, and what I love to see it full. (laughs) That means sis is getting paid. (laughs) Right. And just to add, like, I typically only are working with um, young adults and older. So I'm not really seeing teenagers or uh, children at this moment. So. Mm, Good to know. Good to know. Uh, As mentioned earlier, this is a Planned Parenthood episode, which does not necessarily mean that we're talking about the organization. Planned Parenthood just can be anything dealing with planning to be a parent. Um, Now, one of the things that we discussed uh, way, way back when during our intake meeting was uh, increasing access to sex education and other resources. So um, just in the realm of like your education what was uh sex ed like for you as well as uh if you let's say had an opportunity to expand access to it what would that expansion look like for yourself yeah so um coming from a conservative southern background sex education looked a lot like and from what i hear it's pretty similar to abstinent base right? So it was like very shameful, very stigmatizing, very like, um, if you have sex, your penis is going to fall off, or (laughs) you're going to get, you're going to get AIDS and die. Like it was very, very, uh, shaming. And, um, and it was pretty awkward because at that time, you know, you're a teenager and you are hypersexual most of the time. So it was like, even though people were hypersexual, you weren't taught really how to be sexual beings. Um, so 
one of the things that I would push and part of the reason why I became a sex therapist is to kind of educate people on all these different things, right? There's no STI right now that is life-threatening, even with HIV, which is, you know, I know that that one is the one that everyone is still afraid of. There's medicine now that you can't transmit it. If you're taking your medicine, you equals you. Um, If you're keeping up with yourself, there shouldn't be really any major issues like taking your medicine every day, you should be fine. People are living happy and normal lives. Um, but there's so much stigma, right? Even about like more the more common STIs like HPV and herpes, people don't even hear about those as much. Um, there's so much stigma about them, but almost everyone has it, right? And most of the time for HPV, it clears up on its own. And so being able to have a thorough sex education where I'm able to explain and it not to like shame anyone for being hypersexual, not to shame anyone for engaging in those type of things and provide them with possible ways to kind of have consent and talking about consent and possible ways for contraceptive, right? So some people are allergic to latex, but what are some other Mm -hmm. condoms that we can use? What are some other things that we can do to protect ourselves and others? If we are STI positive, which most of the world is, right? Mm Um, normalizing that and being like, okay, now I'm STI positive. How do I continue living my life and having a healthy, happy sexual life like that? Ooh, uh, you're just uh, hitting everybody with some knowledge bombs today. Like one, there are no STIs that are life-threatening. And that's a, something that's good to know that you can live a long life. You can live a happy life. You can have a sexually free life, regardless of if you have a STI that's present. And the other thing is when you brought up different condoms. And I know like for myself, uh, I've encountered so many people over the years who's just like, oh, uh, like either they'll make an excuse that they they have a latex allergy or uh, and it, even if it was true, I'm like, okay, that's fine. Uh, even though you entered into this um, in the mindset that, oh, I don't want to use condoms. And when I brought that up, now you're saying you uh, have a latex allergy. And then I hit you with that. Well, guess what? I only purchased non-latex condoms anyways. So look, fair game let's <laughs> like but um people don't often know that there are different types of condoms out there like for myself i prefer skins because uh, I, mm-hmm. if i'm not mistaken like all of their condoms are not latex um, yeah i believe they're lambskin i think so uh yeah. I, I forget um uh, and it's crazy i have one in my room so i can definitely like look it up uh and the other thing is like if you are looking to, you know, regular latex uh, condoms, like you have options there too. You have the bare skin um, that, you know, Trojan uh, has one, um, B condoms, they have one. Um, that's a black owned condom company for people who don't know. Um, you have the, okay, I was about to say Magnums, but I do not recommend Magnums for anybody. Those things are thick and that no. Do not purchase Magnums, people. Do not. <laughs> I know they're a part of Trojan, but don't do it. You have Lifestyles, which is actually a pretty um, great condom brand. Um, but there's like so many different um, brands out there that you can shop for that will fit your needs. Uh, if you have, if you like the ribbed kind, to uh, I haven't tried them myself. I've been wanting to try it, but it's like you you, you can try different uh, types of condoms to please yourself, um, please other people, to see what is your fancy. Um, and we, I would say as a society, we don't push that. Um, that goes into like our sex education. Like if you're in a classroom where you are told, okay, abstinence only, don't do this, that, and the third, and you um, mentioned some birth control because if some abstinence only um, do talk about birth control briefly, and they talk about condoms, but they don't even go in detail about those different condoms. And it's just, it's a failure all, all around. And they don't show you how to use them, right? Like <laughs> most apps in the base. Now there are, I've seen a couple where they'll use like the banana, but even that is kind of like, okay, I guess a penis is not a banana, but um, 
they don't show you how to use contraceptive correctly. They don't show you the different types. Like even when I was learning about birth control, all they told me was the pills, which is like, that's not useful for everybody. Um, IUDs are not useful for everybody, right? Using, figuring out what works for you. And then when you're in an abstinent-based sex education, you're not learning about yourself. Forget about being intimate with other people. You're feeling shame just for masturbation. Mm. Right. So how do you how do I expect to engage in a like healthy sexual relationship with another person if I feel shame every time I touch myself and figure out what works for me? Mm. That's a word. That's a fucking word. And look, masturbate, people find ways to please yourself. Um, And I feel for me personally, I feel as though um, masturbating, understanding yourself in that way helps you tell your partner how you like to be pleased because it is hard to expect somebody to know how to please you when you don't know how to please yourself essentially so um another thing that we ended up talking about um this was more so in access of education but I, it does have a broader impact but the uh, impact uh, on the african-american community due to the lack of education in uh, resources Yeah, so because of the lack of resources, and unfortunately, a lot of these like uh, abstinent based sexual educations are in these areas where like you're not getting enough, like you're not getting enough funds for that program, right? So when I used to work in Meriwether, which is like the middle of nowhere, (laughs) they didn't even have sex education in their class. They had a health class that went over like briefly over certain things did not have like thorough sex education or sex education as a whole. And because of that, in those areas, STIs are the highest. We as African-Americans are one of the highest for almost all STIs. And we are not very knowledgeable, right? So there's a lot of times where African-American people will be like, well, I'm not gay, so I'm not going to get HIV. And you're like, well, African-American females are one of the highest for HIV under bisexual men. Right. But people don't understand that or think that because they're like, oh, well, that's a gay disease. And it's not. Mm. Um, We're one of the highest for a lot of things. And I think what plays part in that as well is like access to health care. Right. So if I don't have access to adequate health care, if it takes me 30 minutes to get to the hospital, do you think it's going to and I barely have a car or don't have transportation? Do you think I'm going to go to the doctor regularly? once a year to pay for STI testing, which is not cheap Mm. most of the time. No, I'm not going to do this. It's just not priority on my list, right? So like, for instance, I was in Alabama about a year or two ago and there was a bulletin board that said syphilis is on the rise, Mm. right? And it was like, the fact that there has a, there's a big bulletin board that's talking about this is on the rise means that there is an issue, but there's not enough access to healthcare. There's not enough access to education. There's not enough adequate access to, if I have an STI, how do I maintain this, right? So either I have to take antibiotics or I have to take some sort of regular medication to make sure I'm okay. But all of those things take resources, that takes money, takes transportation. And unfortunately, as minorities, we don't always have that luxury. Mm. And uh, one of the things I think about when it comes to um, the impact of like just even knowing about sexuality and uh, STIs, it's just the messaging behind it. Uh, because, you know, when you don't have time to be re- doing your own independent research or uh, digging deep, going on Google to think about my symptoms and, uh, you know, uh, like we talked in a previous episode, how most STIs are not um uh, uh, they are asy- asymptomatic. So you're not going to uh, have any symptoms displayed. So um, you have this concept of either A, that's only for people who are uh, homosexual. Um, B, if I'm um, not ha- itching, scratching and all this other stuff, I don't have anything. Uh, three, you even have those messages that, you know, you might as well um, have sex raw because it doesn't feel the same. The Holiloquy podcast focuses on the variability of sexual expression. When it comes to sexual expression, we often depend on pornography to illustrate how one must perform sexually. For those who have not learned this by now, the stuff you see in porn is not real. 
Pornography provides a singular perspective of sexual expression that is not often the reality we see during our own sexual encounters. The Holiloquy Podcast is a conversation that takes you outside of the compressed box of what many know about sex. Some of the topics we discuss include kinks, condom usage, status disclosure, and past sexual experiences. The Holiloquy Podcast steps out on sexual norms and recognizes that the norm is not the only normal. Subscribe today and join the conversation. That you know, you might as well um, have sex raw because it doesn't feel the same. Like all of these things that um, you are, well, we as a community are. Um, digesting uh, comes into how we uh, operate within sexual space. Uh, I think about the conversation um, on, uh, I forget the the network, um, but they were talking about the language of beating the pussy up, how that's a very violent term yes. and how um, that, that translate into people who um, will go out and literally try to beat the pussy up as though the the pussy doesn't belong to a whole human being that might feel pain from how hard that you're thrusting uh and how since this is something that is mainstream that's out there that you have all these uh, famous people who have all these women and men who are dating them it's like okay if this person is saying that this is the way that we have sex therefore we should have sex this way you have porn that also does a similar thing where it's a little bit more forceful than actually loving or even um sensual not to say all you know sexual encounters have to be sensual but you know when you uh, constantly seeing that oh you have to beat that pussy you think oh okay in my sexual encounters let's beat the pussy up every single time but that's not that's not sex (laughs) like there's more to sex than just beating the pussy up there's more to sex and foreplay and foreplay looks different for every single person and has different uh, ways of being you know played out throughout the sex encounter all of that so I think a lot of um, the impact from STIs, poor um, sexual education, co- goes into the messaging behind it as well. Oh yeah, I agree. Like I feel like, especially for our African American men, we they're told like that you're you know you're supposed to have a high body count, you're supposed to be having sex with every single person, but it's so weird. It's like uh, it's so contradicting because African American females culturally they're like no, you know, you can't have more than three people for your body count and this, that, and the third, or you're dirty. But then you hear stories like um, basketball players said they cheated on their girlfriends and they've slept with 300 women. 300, right? And that's, and that's, to them, that's being seen. Like, if you hear, as you said, in media and music, it's like, well, he's a player. That means he's, he, you know, he's, he's attractive. He has money. Of course, he's going to be sleeping with all of these different women. Mm -hmm. and it's acceptable because of that uh and it's just like but this person is still a cheater i think about i think it was usher who was getting sued for giving somebody sti or something like that and i remember uh, how a lot of people was just like it ain't no way that uh usher slept with this um that you know this fat shame because she she was a plus-size woman but this fat b and all this other stuff and i'm like he probably slept with her like <laughs> this man is out here sleeping around with a lot of people um this has been on record that he does fool around with people and this person said that she got it from him let's give her the benefit of the doubt here because if he's having sex with um this person without a condom who else is he having sex without a condom with so it's like yeah, she probably could have gotten it from somebody else, but at the same time, she also could have gotten it from him. Let's not shame this person. Let's not uh, try to make this celebrity holier than thou when, come on, we're all human now here. He made a mistake or he did something on purpose. I don't care what it is, but at the end of the day, give the person the benefit of doubt when it does come to some things like this. Uh, and Oh, what were you about to say? Yeah, I was going to add to that. So, and yeah, it was alleged that he gave this girl herpes, right? And so, but then you look at the comments and you see how ignorant, like, people's view on it. Like, 
Usher has herpes. No, that can't be right. Like they were dismissing everything about him. And like, the thing is, herpes is one of those things that are asymptomatic that most people have. They don't even know they have it. Mm -hmm. And it was like, maybe he could have, maybe you can't. A lot of the times it's really hard to prove whether or not someone gave you herpes because you can have it in your body and be dormant for years and not know it. But one of the things that made me think about though, I remember them going ham on Usher. Like even now, like there's still these like herpes jokes about her Usher. But about a couple years prior to that, Charlie Sheen was actively having sex with people with HIV. Mm. And I remember like he still kept his job. Like I remember like it was a big blow up a little bit for like a couple months and then it just died down and like no one else made any jokes about it, nothing else. And it was like kind of crazy how even if, if I wouldn't put STIs on a tier, but HIV is the one that people are the most scared of, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was like, it's kind of crazy how they kind of just was like, oh, okay, Charlie Sheen has HIV and he gave people, were sleeping actively with people with HIV and not telling people. And they just kind of like brushed that under the rug. Whereas like, they're still going ham on our share about herpes. Like, I don't hear any jokes about Charlie Sheen. Child, isn't that a felony? Um, so there is this push towards not making, um, about STIs not becoming um, a felony, giving them to someone anymore, because mm-hmm. I, I don't know when it's going into effect. I know in California, I think they've done away with that law, only because the part of the reason why they had that law was because it was a deadly thing, right? Like, mm-hmm. if I gave you HIV or I gave you AIDS or whatever, um, it was a death sentence at that time, but now with everything being like not a death sentence and you can live happy and healthy lives with it, um, I think you still have a fine, but it's not like um, a death sentence or you don't have to go to like prison for. Oh, that's good to know. But uh, I I agree. Like, uh, I honestly forgot all about the Charlotte Sheen uh, (laughs) incident. So that's a good point. And uh, even though this is going off topic, I think about how most definitely when it does come to media spaces, um, Black individuals are often held to the higher esteem than those who are not uh, uh, people of color, um, those who are white. Like, even when it comes to, you know, the um, situation with, um, what's his name? Uh, what's that man's name? Um, oh, with um, uh, Will Smith and that little slap or whatever. Oh, yeah. That becomes coined as the slap that's heard across the world and all this other BS. But it's like, he's not the only person who's slapping motherfuckers around here. Like, why are we holding him to a higher esteem than we are uh, holding anybody else who's been in similar positions as him? Like, why? Why is it that we forever hold, like, Black men and Black women to the highest extent of accountability and give the bare minimum to uh, everybody else? Yeah, I definitely agree. It's like, it sucks because it's like, that's the pressure that you are taught like pretty much like all your life right I you know I did good on this test but like I could do better I have to do better I have to be above my peers because all the things that are up against me right all the pressure of being a black person and making it as they say like making it out the mud and things of that nature Mm -hmm. it's wild um to get back into the uh conversation uh we did you brought it up earlier, but this is also something that we did uh, talk about uh, in regards to the intake meeting. And that was, you know, discuss, uh, the, just a general discussion about consent, how that is lacking education and whatnot. Uh, what is your uh, perspective on that? And also, can you speak on um, can, the Can I Wear Your Hat video? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so... I think that's another thing that is not talked a lot about sexual education. So in sexual education, you know, you hear the basics, you may hear about STIs and things of that nature, but consent is not really talked about. And I know a lot of situations where women will say, remember the hold me too movement, right? Well, they'll say, well, I told them I didn't really want to do this or I was drinking or I, my body language showed that I didn't want to and they would just be in these situations because they didn't feel comfortable enough saying no. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. And the fear of if I say no, will something physical happen to me, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and I've also seen situations where it's like guys have actively taken condoms off of people, 
I've mm. been in a situation where I've seen that happen to a girl and I like, let's say I was in a threesome and I was like, I don't want to, I don't, I, we need to stop this immediately. Mm. And this was his first time meeting her. And so it was like having these conversations of these, like these main things of consent, what does consent look like? Paying attention to body language, paying attention to your needs, your wants, and not just just doing something just because someone's there, instilling self-esteem and self-worth, right? Like those are all major components of these consents that that's not talked about at all in sexual education. So a little bit about the can I wear your hat? And I think can you wear your hat is kind of like my favorite video. I remember watching it in undergrad and being like, this is so cool. And it talks about um, consent. So one thing that we don't really think about a lot was like when we think about rape we think about it in the idea of like some creepy guy in the bushes like coming out Mm -hmm. and like grabbing you and like throwing you in the car and raping you which I mean there are instances of that but most of the time if you're being raped is by someone you know most of the time if you're being raped most instances of rape are from a partner someone that you've already been intimate with before Mm -hmm. right and so with that being said the way that we view like rape and consent needs to kind of change right and so the awesome thing about can I wear your hat it talks about so even though one of the things about can I wear your hat it talks about like using the hat as like the form of consent so this girl has a hat on her head and the guy was like can I wear your hat and so every time he engages or he wants to wear the hat he has to ask just like Anytime you want to be intimate with someone, you should ask. Mm -hmm. And there's a sentence in the in the video that's like, even though I wear your hat regularly and I love your hat and we always, you know, have a fun time when I wear your hat, I have to ask for it again. I can't just assume that you're going to just give me your hat. And so that's a really awesome thing, because even with a partner, there's times where I mean, you know, there's, I've heard multiple stories of women who have just been like drunk with their partner and the guy just starts to have sex with them, even though they don't really want to do it, but they're like, well, I'm here now and I can't say no, Mm. but always say no. You can say no to the point where you're naked. You can say no to the point where they're already inside of you and you no longer want it anymore. And I think that's the hard part is being able to say no at any point of that. It doesn't matter how drunk you are. And I think that's the um, thing that a lot of people do not connect with or either uh, know that they have the option to do is say no during the act, um, be- like while completely nude or whatever. Because uh, I will say, at least uh, for my own personal experience, I've had been with someone who did remove a condom without my consent and without my know-how. And it's just like, who were you to make that decision about the trajectory of my life because of what you thought I would be comfortable with without communicating with that. Uh, And like that does leave you just in a place of just thinking. Now you have to uh, worry about your health. You have to make sure you go get tested and all these other things. Change your your, uh, livelihood um, just to accommodate for this one, uh, I can't even say mishap, but this thing that happened to you uh and uh to know like you have that option just like hey what you're doing I'm no longer comfortable with it's time for me to go or we we just cannot be here together um but a lot of people don't even know that no is really an option yeah and taking a condom off is rape it is there's actually I'm trying to remember the name of the movie there's actually a movie about it is it a show I can't remember it when I remember it. It was on HBO. It was actually a really, really good movie. And that, I mean, it talks about how that, that is rape. Mm-hmm. Like, um, it's, it's, and it's, uh, it's the lack of giving people the, the, the option. Because it's like to, if you, if you chose, like, for anybody who've ever experienced that, uh, it's like, if that other person actually stopped and communicated with you, hey, are you comfortable with this? There's a possibility 
if they are comfortable with you and they trust you enough, they might have even said, yes, oh yeah, we can remove the condom. Most definitely if you've had, you know, sex with that person on an ongoing basis. Sometimes, no. Like even today, well, as of this recording, to choose to just have sex with somebody, most definitely if it's somebody with a, a, a vulva uh, who can give birth, you're you're setting them up to potentially die. Like this is, <laughs> like, that's, that is literally a, a violent act to do that. Because one, if they get pregnant, either they are going to be forced to have the child or uh, if they have the funds and able to get an abortion um, that might benefit them there, but they still have to do all that. They have to actively uh, find ways of either raising that child or uh, getting rid of that child. And it's all because you wanted to be selfish in that moment and violate their body. Yeah. The name of the show was called I May Destroy You. But on another topic, I love it. yeah, on another topic of consent that is not talked about is people who lie in order to have sex, right? So there was actually an SVU movie of episode about it, but it's like men will, and it's, it's so normalized in our culture, mm-hmm. men will be like, oh no, I want a relationship with you. I want to be with you just so he can have sex with the girl, have sex with the girl, and then stop talking to her, mm-hmm. right? Or he'll say, oh, I can... Um, I can make you a star. I can do these things for you. I, I have all of this money or I have all of these things and I can end up, you know, we're, we're having a conversation about a contractual sexual experience. If you have give sex to me, I will end up do, doing this for you. And then they end up having sex and they're like, oh, wait, never mind. I was just kidding. I lied about it. But now I already have sex with you now. And there, there was a whole topic about that on CSI where it's like, that's sexual assault, mm-hmm. right? Because you are lying. We, I can, I can't give you ultimate consent. So, um, yeah, that happened. <laughs> but like, uh, when it comes to consent, um, yeah, we we just do not communicate enough about it in general. Uh, it's like we don't we don't have the understanding that uh, asking for permission is okay. Uh, we don't uh, think about how our actions when it comes to um, having sex with other people can violate the other person because we're so focused on our own needs. Uh, We don't even talk about the nuances of what is and what makes up sexual assault, sexual violence at at all, Um, where a lot of people just think that, you know, they just have that full permission to do whatever the fuck they want um, because of whatever sexual position they may hold. And that's just not true. Uh, And I think a lot of that goes into narratives. Uh, Like some of the things that I've been thinking about this weekend is like uh, myths and how myths are based in narrative. Uh, We're told that, you know, women are there for the pleasure of men and not the other way uh, way around. Uh, We're told that um, just that idea of she asked for it based off of what she's wearing, uh, how she was dancing in the club and all these other things. But, you know, that is not true. Uh, the only way that you can ask for something is if you vocalize it. Um, and it's, it's just the consent in general. We, we just don't handle that in an appropriate manner at all throughout this country. Uh, we just allow people to do whatever the fuck they want to do and <laughs> um, not hold anyone truly accountable for whenever they do violate somebody. And it, it still uh, makes me angry that uh, someone can violate someone, um, like sexually, uh, sexually violate somebody, be it rape, assault, uh, or just generalized sexual violence. And actually, let's just go specifically with rape. You can rape somebody and get less time than just having a dime bag of weed in Mm -hmm. this country like i've seen court cases where somebody was either they either got time served after like three um three months plus they will have to serve about five months on top of that or house arrest is the only thing they get one year two years and this can even be for somebody who's a pedophile they only get like three five years max but again carrying around 
an ounce of weed, you're just free to do whatever the fuck you want. Right. I, I definitely agree. Cause it's like, and and I think, you know, I think that's the question that always comes up. Like when someone is sexually assaulted or raped, like, well, why didn't you tell anyone? Right. If it was that bad, why didn't you tell anyone? But I think that leads into it, right? If it is already super vulnerable, I was completely violated, my body was violated, it was a traumatic experience. And now, you know, if I'm a female, I have to go within 24 hours, I have to go to the doctor, they have to like test me for STIs, they have to look and see for any like uh, damage or anything like that, which is also super violating. Mm. And then after all of that, I go to court, I have to repeat that story, that traumatic story over and over again and convince people, regardless of what I was wearing, regardless of what I was doing, that uh, I didn't deserve it, which is already like crazy. Um, and then this person gets out in a year gets out there in the same hometown that I'm in, they can always come back, they could still terrorize me. And if it's a situation like, I remember not too long ago, there was a case of this um, lacrosse player and he raped somebody and the girl ended up basically being bullied. Like, he ended up going to like getting probation or something. Mm-hmm. Um, but the girl basically ended up getting bullied so much in her college that she had to drop out. Mm. Right. But she was the victim in the situation. And I think at any at some point he even admitted that he raped her. But it was just like it is whatever. what it is. Like you're not gonna hold the man accountable, whatever. So it, it he he can go out and rape somebody else and know that he'll be just fine. And that's the thing that sucks about it all. Um, like even when it comes to like my research, just looking at some of the cases that's gone on and like I, I'm still stuck on this one case that happened um, last year where this kid, uh, well, he's an adult now. Uh, he raped a 16 year old. Uh, he literally put his hand over her mouth. She was crying and he told her stop being such a baby. And all of this stuff is um, he admitted to in court. And all he got was uh, probation. And that was it. And his probation only lasted for like, I think, a year. <laughs> and, and other than that, it's just, it's just like, why you didn't have to come to court for this. You should have just stayed home. Like this, this, um, this young lady doesn't have, I think the um, reason behind it was that the judge, I think this is the case. The judge was like, well, clearly there's not enough psychological damage for this person who's in therapy to give him more time. Um, what? Right. That's crazy. Like this is the society that we live in. <laughs> like, and that is a and that's an open and, and shut case. And a lot of cases aren't even like that. Like there are certain places where if you're married, it's super hard to even say that you were raped. Like mm-hmm. they're like, Well, I mean, you were married to him. You're that's your husband. Like he deserves your body of some sort. You no. Know? It's just ridiculous. Right. You know, <laughs> I'm glad that you used that example, because when I um, gave consent workshops uh, on college campuses, and I always use that example of, you know, if your wife comes home, your partner comes home to you, then just because you don't own them, like they're your they're your partner, but they do not belong to you. And having that discussion always triggered somebody and now they're at a battle with their cognitive dissonance like but that's mine that's my girl but this is a whole human being regardless like you don't own them and just trying to break down that psyche that they do not own them uh own their partner was always uh (laughs) a debate that like that's the thing that people just don't want to take uh, responsibility or acknowledgement of that just because this is my partner that I'm spending time with them that I do not really own them that their sexual being is uh under under the ownership of themselves rather than of me Right. And the the example I always give to that was, well, okay, how would you feel since she's your partner, right? And y'all own each other's bodies. How would you feel if she, you know, got a strap on and pegged you one night and you didn't know about it? Then they're like, oh, no, no, I can't do that. Like, that's not like, I don't want that. Okay. So it's the same situation, right? Or like feeding back to what we were talking about a little bit before of like, 
guys lying to have sex like they're like I want a relationship or I want this and that and they're like that's no I mean people always do that that's not like assault that's not an issue but I'm like but y'all are the same men who if you found out a girl was trans even though she has the bottom surgery and everything and you found out later now you're offended because you didn't get consent what's the difference those are both about consent Mm. She, see, that's when you drop a mic, like, for real. Um, the lesson of the day is if you want to teach uh, people how to consent, all about consent, peg them while they're sleeping. I'm joking. Do not do that, people. <laughs> do not. I own your body. <laughs> Didn't you? Well, if you own my body, I own your body, right? So if you just going to rape me, then, well, I mean, I guess I could peg you, right? Oh, now it's different. Now consent makes sense. <laughs> it's called mutual rape, duh. Like, <laughs> that's not a thing, people. Let that Please don't rape people. <laughs> Please don't. Please don't be out here. Look, this, the Holiloquy podcast is not telling you to go out there and rape people and call it mutual rape. That is not a thing. <laughs> That's still illegal. You might get less time than having some weed, but it's still legal unless you're black. Then it's just going to be you might get you might get the max. You might, no guarantee. Um, but look, can I be out here raping people? Uh, I would say now it will be a good time to transition into some sex questions. And for those who are new to the show, um, usually this will be a never have I ever se- section. But since it's Sharita, I already told her since our very first episode, all of our episodes, it's just going to be sex questions because I love the way her mind is. You ready? Mm-hmm. So have you ever tried phone or video chat sex with a partner or stranger? Yes. How was that? um phone sex i've been doing that since i was a teenager don't judge me no judgment Uh, judge your mama okay (laughs) (laughs) phone sex is weird to me uh i'm not a huge fan of it i mean um video is cool so i've had like long long distance partners and so like being able to actually like see them touching themselves and things of that nature it's pretty cool Mm-hmm. I fucks with that. I, I've definitely had um, phone sex in the past. Also, as a teenager, I was actually like very great at it. <laughs> but after a while, I'm like, you know what? I'm not really because I, I hate talking on the phone now. It's not because of the phone sex situation. It's just working in customer service. You hate phones after that. So I, I don't want to do any kind of phone sex. Video chat, maybe I might be into it. Uh, I think about uh, a time when my uh, uh, ex-partner um, video chatted me for my birthday and decided to do a strip tease. It was cute and I appreciated the thought, but I also was like, look, I'm going to be real with you your moves ain't moving like you thought you was moving i i appreciate the thought i really do i love that but um we could just have a conversation fam let's just talk <laughs> well i don't know i'm awkward at strip teases in general like i've tried to do it one time and i like fail and i was just like you know what let's just, let me just take the clothes off now we're just gonna act like this didn't happen i'm too clumsy for that but (laughs) oh god yes (laughs) i'm with you i like like video because okay so i'm not a huge fan of like unsolicited dicks of course it's just it doesn't do anything for me it's like all right cool you have a penis i mean not that all penises look alike but it's just a penis not doing anything for me Mm-hmm. But the video, I get to watch like you coming, and that's cool. Like I like to hear it and see it, and that's the part that I like the most. Mm-hmm. So, what you're telling me is send videos, not dick pics. <laughs> and I, I can back. I, I support that because personally, I cannot stand a dick pic because I'm just like, look, I'm. A, uh, I've seen plenty of dicks in my life. Um, your dick is nothing special. It might look cute or whatever, but it's nothing special. It's a dick. That's all. Uh, a video kind of might turn me on a little bit, but no, I am a body person. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't care if you're um, plus size like myself or a very thin person, whatever. I will appreciate you a lot more if you send me like a full body picture. It doesn't even have to be a nude. And that's a funny thing. I appreciate bodies more than I uh, appreciate like an an appendage. Like, I don't care about that. Uh, Like, 
like on these apps, these people who are, you know, like DL don't want to send a, a face pic and all this other stuff. I'm like, whatever, do you, I'm not here to judge for wherever your journey is. Um, but they're happy to send like a, a dick pic and all this other stuff. I'm like, okay, that's cute to see, but that's not doing anything for me. Now, if you try to hook up, because look, with me and you, it's just going to be a hookup thing because I'm not trying to do anything long term. You might make it to a regular depending on how the sex turns out. But if you send me a body pic, you'll have a, a better chance of hooking up. I, like, and the funny thing is not too many people are willing to do it. It's just like dick picking or nothing. And I'm like, oh, well, I guess we're not hooking up. <laughs> like, <laughs> but yeah, I agree. Body yeah. Body pics are nice. Like, I love a good like print. Like, yeah, I, I would prefer, I actually prefer, like, the semi-nude look versus completely naked. Like, it's completely naked, it's cool. Like, I've seen ass and titties before, I've seen mm. dicks before, but just, like, being semi-naked, but, like, seeing, like, the rest of your silhouette. Like, I, like, like you said, seeing tits and ass before, like, me, for me, like, I can get turned on by seeing a nude yeah or whatever but it doesn't sexually stimulate now let me say if i'm going through the timeline and i see somebody in like a bikini oh my god i'm just like oh okay you looking good let me go ahead and you know keep on going it's not even the reveal of it all it's just it looks very good on you and that's the thing that i appreciate most like um going back on that former partner i literally um this was uh no that was valentine's day for the, the strip tease the birthday I, I purchased the outfit and i was like okay this is what the outfit is going to be you like cat ear so we're going to do this cat ear thing going on but i was like look come in with your um your your tights from we work out all this like I, I got a full outfit and i was just like that right there turn me the fuck up <laughs> like i don't know it's, it's just something about the pr presentation of it all versus just being full on nude so another question have you ever uh, recreated a steamy scene from a film or tv show and are there any scenes you like to act out i don't think i've recreated a steamy scene from a tv show um there's this one scene that i do I would be interested in acting out. I'm not sure how it'll work. So there's this movie, I remember watching it uh, called Taking Lives. And there was Angelina Jolie and this other, uh, I think it was Billy Bob Thornton, maybe. And they were just like, like it was rough. And it was like, he was, she was like on the kitchen table. I was just mm -hmm. like, yes. This, I remember being a child and just like recording, like rewinding that scene like over and over again instead of watching porn. Like it was hot. So I'd probably like to recreate that if I had to recreate one. Mm, respect, respect. Um, for me, I, there's no scene that I would want to recreate um, because the scenes that be in my mind, I'm just like, that's the only thing I want to do. Like ever since a young age, I've been dreaming of the day where I can go out in space or go into like an air shuttle where we go into zero gravity and just have sex there and i i dream for zero gravity sex lord let there be a fucking <laughs> machine that i can go into with my fucking partner and that's it that's the only that's the only sexual fantasy that i just want and that's it like no movie scenes none of that just that that seems I, complicated it does but it, it seems and messy. So, like so much fun like just to be floating and not, not have to worry about the friction of like if you were in water yeah it's just you floating and yeah that just needs to happen lord bless me <laughs> no, no. you're gonna have like a zero gravity room in your house and it's Girl, gonna happen speak on it yes all right <laughs> so that's going to be the end of the show everyone sharita thank you so much for you know participating in the holiloquy podcast i love you so much 
um, to the listeners, thank y'all so much for listening to the Whole Little Wiki Podcast, where we step out and speak on sexuality. Just in case no one else told you this today, you are beautiful, you are worthy of happiness and joy, you are enough and then some. You may not live up to the expectations of others, but that is okay. You are only required to walk in your own shoes. May each day you live lead you towards abundance. With that said, love you all and see you next episode. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Holiloquy Podcast, where we step out and speak on sexuality. You can subscribe to the podcast through your favorite podcasting app and find us on the web at www.holiloquy.com. That's www.h-e-a-u-x-l-i-l-o-q-u-y.com. Share the podcast with your friends and join the conversation.